welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. Now, in previous episodes, we've talked about Activision Blizzard as well as EA. So today, it's finally time for me to get into another video game company so many of you have requested, Ubisoft. Recently, Ubisoft has slammed Activision for their culture of abuse and supported the employee walkouts. Employees at Ubisoft have come out in support of them in solidarity because they too have faced abuse. So what do these two companies have in common? Well, let's dive right in and find out. Ubisoft started with the five Guy Lamont brothers who grew up in a small village in Northwest France. Their parents owned a farming company and after attending university, the brothers joined the family business and diversified its approach. The business my parents had was actually declining, so we had to find new businesses. So my older brother Claude started with CD Audio. That was a new revolution. Then they started to sell computers to farmers. After that, they created a shop that sold all sorts of things for farmers on top of normal chemicals and parts. In this shop, we started to sell video games because they were part of things that could be supplied. We had 20 machines in stock and probably 100 copies of software. When he went to the UK, my brother Claude realized that he was buying from his French supplier at two times the cost it was sold in the UK to the public. So that's where he said, maybe there's a business here. It was just at the beginning of the Amstrad, a popular European gaming PC. And so in 1984, we started a mail order company. Ubisoft officially came into being in 1986. Eve says that they went from mail orders to selling the games and retailers. And once his brother discovered the price difference, he started to import the games. So they were selling them at half the price of other suppliers. Christine Burgess Quimard, executive director of Worldwide Studios said they had a bunch of kids presenting game ideas to them and they took the risk to see where it would lead. Christine explains that a lot of their developers at the time were only 18 or 19 and Michel Ansel, creator of Rayman and Beyond Good and Evil said that he was only around 14 or 15 when he started programming. He says that it was 1987 or 88 and a lot of people were talking about the ozone layer problem in the stratosphere. So I did a funny animation with the molecules of the ozone and the oxygen and you had the bad CFC bullying and breaking the oxygen. It was like a short animated movie. I sent this project to Ubisoft because they were doing a contest in a magazine that would let you win a computer. I won nothing, but I got a phone call from Ubisoft. At this point, Ubisoft was only a small apartment at the time, truly a startup. In these days, Ubisoft was trying to be close to Nintendo or Sega. One of the brothers, Michel, worked on the animation system. And at the time the article was written, he was the CEO of Gameloft. Michel Ansel called him a visionary who truly understood how to take on young developers and make them more professional. Ansel said there was a great environment at Ubisoft because you could leave, do your own thing and come back as long as you had good ideas and were willing to work. The two Michels worked together to create Rayman. And according to Ansel, they were supposed to create the game for the Super Nintendo CD system, which never came out. Then when Michel took over the project, he said that if they were going to organize the project and do it right, they would need a lot more people and a lot of money. Ansel says that they moved to the Atari Jaguar, then the PlayStation, and the project became bigger and bigger. Ubisoft became recognized because of Rayman. By 1993, they were one of the largest distributors of video games in France. Before long, the internet arrived in Europe and they saw the opportunity to take advantage of it. They went public in 1996 and their IPO raised over $80 million. They could use this to expand, to open into new markets and to take some risks. Serge Hasquet, the editorial executive director, said that at that point in time, they were extremely action adventure oriented. They began working on a first person shooter game and worked on Red Storm. Quote, in 2001, when the original Xbox came, nobody wanted to develop it. Yves decided that was more important because the technology was there. It was better than the previous console and he wanted to bet on this one. With Ghost Recon, we decided to embrace Xbox Live. We were the only one with Halo to be on Xbox Live in a big way. They made quite a few successful moves in these early years, even when they were considered risks at the time. Ubisoft took a huge risk when they gained Red Storm Entertainment. And once the company proved themselves more than capable, they absorbed the entertainment division of the learning company, which held licenses for games like Myst, Chessmaster, and Prince of Persia. 
They moved forward with Miss Three Exile, which did extremely well and rebooted Prince of Persia, which solidified their status as an elite studio. Assassin's Creed built upon the Prince of Persia series concept released in 2007 and eventually became their best-selling franchise and one of the highest selling video game franchises of all time. As an aside, sci-fi author John L. Biswinger did at one point sue Ubisoft claiming that the game steals ideas and themes from his 2002 novel, Link. As the lawsuit was eventually dropped though, I'm not going to talk much about these controversies today. Believe me, we have much more to get into. That said, it seemed like Ubisoft was everything you could want in a company at first. They gave young people a chance to develop their skills and by hiring 18 and 19 year olds, they were not only listening to their target audience, but letting their target audience create their games. They were by no means a studio or game killer like EA had become notorious for, considering how they treated Myst and Prince of Persia. A passionate family company, Ubisoft was all you could want. Well, until they weren't, that is. Before we get into the horrors that went on behind the scenes, let's talk about the bumpy road Ubisoft had along the way. After all, it was not entirely smooth sailing. The game Beyond Good and Evil was meant to combine the cinematic storytelling of a Miyazaki film with gameplay that blended puzzle solving, exploration, and stealth. Even though the game has been praised in a jam-packed holiday season competing against Final Fantasy X2, Call of Duty, and their own Prince of Persia game, it simply didn't compete. Their worries only grew in the early 2000s. With development costs rising in the early 2000s, many publishers started looking into consolidating their businesses. Squaresoft merged with Enix in 2003, Sega merged with Sammy in 2004, and in 2007, Electronic Arts lost its spot at the top of the publishing food chain when Vivendi agreed to purchase Activision and formed the new entity, Activision Blizzard. Ubisoft was forced into the merger discussions in late 2004 when Electronic Arts announced it had purchased 20% of Ubisoft shares unbeknownst to the company's executives. This was a large block of shares outside of the Guillemot family, giving the company adequate leverage to wage a proxy battle and shape Ubisoft's future direction. According to Eves, one guy from EA called me on a Sunday afternoon saying, we just bought 20% of your company. So we just wanted to tell you that because it is going to be public tomorrow. At the time, EA was trying to buy Activision and they were close to a deal. They had discussions on the last bits and they called Bobby to say, we bought 20% of Ubisoft. What worried Eves as well as the rest of the company was that EA didn't seem to know what they were going to do with the stock in the first place. Or if they did know, they certainly weren't sharing. It wasn't until 2010, after six years of owning the stock, that EA quietly sold its shares, temporarily freeing Ubisoft from the threat of a hostile takeover. Years later though, there was another possibility of takeover when the former Activision owner Vivendi bought a 6.6% stake in Ubisoft for 140 million euros and spent an additional 20 million to acquire 6.2% in Gameloft. In July, 2013, Vivendi sold its 85% stake in Activision Blizzard for more than $8 billion, with the corporation claiming at the time that it wanted to focus on the TV and music portions of its business. There were some signs of tension within the executive circle at the company. Court filings revealed that Activision CEO, Bobby Kotick was nearly fired during the purchase of Activision Blizzard from Vivendi. This was reportedly due to his refusal to approve any sale of Vivendi's shares that didn't include his investment group. I really wonder who's going to fire him, Vivendi's former chief executive, jean Fracaud Dubois said in an email at the time. Myself happily, tomorrow if you want, responded Felipe Capron, Vivendi's then chief financial officer and Activision chairman. In statements released by Ubisoft and Gameloft, both have expressed an intention to remain independent. Now, hindsight is only 2020 here, and I wish Bobby was fired back then. We all know from the recent Activision updates that I'm not a fan of him and what he's done with the company, and many, many people are unhappy with him as well. I just find it interesting that Activision Blizzard still found a way to warm its into another episode. But the point here is to say that Vivendi, the French media conglomerate, began gobbling up Ubisoft stocks. By June, 2016, they owned 20.1% of their stake, but denied they were trying to take control of the company. Still, French law dictates that if their stake is made to 30%, Vivendi must table a mandatory takeover bid. The Guillemots were obviously not at all thrilled by this, insisting that their hostover takeover approach went against the best interest of Gameloft, both for its activity and its teams. Yves even gave a speech at the 2016 EA stage, discussing the importance of creative independence and stating, quote, I love video games because the real innovation and magic comes from when our teams and players are free to create, free to innovate, free to express themselves, free to take risks and have fun. 
That's what got us here today, and that's what will drive us for another 30 years and beyond, end quote. Even though Eves didn't mention Vivendi by name, it was pretty obvious to anyone listening that that's who he was talking about, and they didn't back off easily either. Their shares continued to rise until in October, 2017, Ubisoft announced that they reached a deal with an investment services provider to buy back up to 4 million shares by the end of that year. At this point, Vivendi owned just over a 27% stake in their shares and almost a quarter of the voting rights. Thankfully, they did sell their shares about 5% to Tencent and slowly relinquish their hold on the company. Ubisoft could breathe easy again. Sales weren't as amazing as their competitors were moving forward, in part because of delayed releases in 2019 and in part because they needed to have strongly differentiated distinct titles. With so many fantastic games on the market, as Bloomberg puts it, being good enough isn't good enough for picky gamers. Even so, Ubisoft was a massive name. They had plans for the future and the family still seemed optimistic about their future. So what the hell went wrong with Ubisoft? By all outward appearances, they seemed to be a company that genuinely cared about camping, creativity, and putting out quality games. The reason I truly wanted to make a point to all of this is to include this section and to show that Ubisoft outwardly did care about freedom and the gaming community. Yet the problem with Ubisoft is much the same as Activision's. It's how they treated people behind closed doors. Now, before we open those doors and take a look at the rot behind the scenes, let's go ahead and take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. It's finally September, which means we are officially in spooky season, which also means it's about time for these temperatures to start getting a little cooler, a little chillier, and all the more reason, as if this year hasn't been enough of a reason, to continue to stay indoors. But sometimes the energy is just not there to come up with a meal plan, go to the grocery store, get it, bring it home, and then separate everything the way you need it, the right amounts, and then cook it, and then serve it, and then clean it. It's sometimes it's just a bit much. But that's why I love HelloFresh, because HelloFresh sends you fresh, pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering seasonal recipes every week so you can skip the work and get to the fun part. And like I said Wednesday, they're now serving some fun seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls, and I am a little too excited. I am really, really curious to see what those are about. So if you wanna get started with HelloFresh and perhaps you also wanna try the pumpkin cinnamon rolls, make sure to go to hellofresh.com casket14 and use code casket14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, that's up to 14 free meals at hellofresh.com slash casket14 and use code casket14. Now, if talking about credit card balances is something that does not make you excited, which I don't really know anyone that that excites, then this one is gonna be for you. Debt can feel utterly crippling and leave you feeling really alone in the world, but Upstart can help you set you back on the path to financial freedom. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off debt with a personal loan. Plus, it's all done online. Upstart is expanding access to affordable credit because they know you're more than just a credit score. And unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at your income and current employment to find a smarter loan rate. So no matter if you're paying off credit cards, consolidating a high interest debt, or you just need a little cushion for some personal expenses, Upstart can get you one fixed monthly payment. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com casket. That's upstart.com casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash casket. So from this point out, I want to issue a content warning for sexual assault and abuse. If any of you are sensitive to these topics, feel free to click away. This just won't be the rest of the episode for you. Now, for those of you sticking around, I'm sure you can imagine what's about to come next and you know it's not gonna be pretty. So let's get into it. As fantastic as Ubisoft may have seemed, that illusion all came crashing down in 2020. From late June to early July, sexual misconduct allegations were lodged against the company, especially against Ashraf Ismail, the creative director of Assassin's Creed. This came after multiple other studio executives and higher-ups were accused within the game's designer industry, such as Chris Avalon from Gato Studio and the employees at Insomniac Games, developer of Marvel's Spider-Man and Ratchet and Clank. At first, the biggest accusation seemed to be that Ashraf had cheated on his wife and lied about his marital status. As a result, he stepped down on June 24th. The lives of my family and my own are shattered, he said in a tweet. I am deeply sorry to everyone hurt in this. Ubisoft confirmed his leave of absence the same day and told Gamasutra that it would begin an investigation into the matter. 
The streamer who first made the allegation against Ishmael said she had a consenting relationship with him, but also said he concealed his marriage from her to the point of claiming the wedding band he wore was for show, so his parents wouldn't be asked why their son wasn't married. For a moment, it seems like this all may have been Ubisoft had to deal with, a scummy director lying to fans to sleep with them. Ubisoft fired him, rightfully so, and claimed that they would investigate the matter to see what other misconduct may have occurred. Unfortunately for Ubisoft though, this was only the first wave. June 26th, employees at Ubisoft Toronto demanded accountability, saying that they didn't feel safe or protected within their own studio. And there was far more to be uncovered here. It wasn't just one or two people, but an entire environment. After internal investigations, Ubisoft announced in early July that two other executives were groping and otherwise sexually assaulting female employees. Both employees were placed on leave and Eves said in a statement, quote, the situation that some of you have experienced or witnessed are absolutely not acceptable. No one should ever feel harassed or disrespected at work and the types of inappropriate behavior we have recently learned about cannot and will not be tolerated. I will give Eves credit at least that his response was better than the sheer denial we saw from many at Activision. Still, this left many wondering if there was more to come. Independent third parties led a series of investigations in response to these allegations. And in early July, people were in the dark about how bad this may become. No one had to wait long for answers though, because on July 6th, it was revealed that rumors circulated that Ubisoft's Toronto co-founder, Maxine Bayland, a 20 year veteran of Ubisoft, had allegedly choked a female employee at a work party. And again, If this had been the only accusation against Maxime, then maybe it wouldn't have been taken all that seriously. Although, I mean, they choke someone. Perhaps it could have been seen as some horrible prank gone wrong, who knows? However, according to one source, it represented a pattern as current and former Ubisoft employees said that working for him made them uncomfortable. He would apparently comment about how female employees dressed, stare at them as they walked across rooms and the women who Balin choked even stepped forward. In an interview with Kotaku, the woman who says Bayland put his hands around her neck at a party shared not just an account of a disturbing incident, but of a structure and culture that she said made her hesitate to report it. You're conditioned to feel like you're lucky to be here, she said of her time at Ubisoft Toronto, which is just one of several Ubisoft studios named by people speaking out. And I think, especially for women, there's a lot of pressure to not rock the boat and to kind of be one of the guys. And it's like, as soon as you blow the whistle, you don't look as that as, okay, I'm setting a standard. You look at it as, well, I don't want to be the one to paint myself with a scarlet letter. And this was no joke. This didn't face repercussions and this was overall seen as an untouchable issue. Company reps said nothing at first, then pointed to Eve's statement where he promised to make serious changes to Ubisoft and take these allegations seriously. Yet once again, this was only the tip of a very scary iceberg. The second executive placed on leave around this time was Tommy Francois. Accusations allege that he would pressure women into sex in front of his employees, kiss people on the lips, and frequently tried to touch female colleagues. Another allegation said he had already been moved between studios because of his behavior, which would truly put a crack in Ubisoft's soul, we had no idea and were taking this seriously story. They know that just transferring an abuser doesn't stop abuse, right? I'll never understand why companies just take someone that has a tendency to sexually assault employees and act like, oh, well, the people here just hate you too much, so we'll just move you somewhere else and it'll be fine. These two executives being placed on leave and the serious accusations of mistreatment were enough to truly grab people's attention. Eves may have promised in early July that the company would change, but now people wanted to know just how awful things had become. Thankfully, the French news source Liberation did exactly that. And they dug up all the dirt that they could on just how awful things had become at Ubisoft and how it went far beyond a couple bad eggs. After buying a subscription to the newspaper, which wasn't exactly all that easy because Google decided to just not translate the French make an account pages for me. So thanks for that Google. But I was able to take a look at what their investigation came up with. So first and foremost, I apologize for any odd wording since I'm going to be reading directly from the translation. 
Secondly, the names of witnesses may have been changed within the article as the authors say it's upon request. But anyways, moving forward, the article first discusses Tommy and claims that there were 20 testimonies of former and current Ubisoft employees that portray him as a toxic manipulator towards women and occasionally men. The article reads, Former star presenter of the Game One channel, Tommy, joined Ubisoft in 2006, joining the editorial department, which is the pride of the company. Specific to the house, the editorial is the control tower that initiates, validates, or approves game projects developed by the group's numerous studios. Promoted vice president of this structure in 2015, this 46-year-old Franco-American has become, thanks to his talents as a speaker, one of the public figures of the company. He is described as a predator at the head of a service largely transformed into a boys club, protected by his status as the right-hand man of Serge Akusa, the creative boss, the one whose intuitions have transformed a family business into world number three, and who remains the backbone of Ubisoft's entire strategy, a company which publicly displays progressive and humanist values to which those it calls its talents do not seem bound by but which must be retained at all cost. Even if this champion of the sector in France probes during job interviews to an environment of manly, heavy, or sometimes a little sexist jokes, even if it means covering up the indefensible. As despicable as the groping and unwanted advances are, what the newspaper explains is that Tommy didn't only act inappropriately during those times, but he created a hostile work environment. I understand that term can be thrown around a bit, but every testimony described a man that was, quote, unable to interact with women without constantly making allusions of a sexual nature, end quote. One woman named Cassandra said that if she had the misfortune of arriving with a trace of toothpaste next to her mouth, Tommy would ask her if she had cut a pipe. I literally don't know what that term even means before, but I think I understand what he's trying to infer. He would also shout in front of everyone, excuse me, I have to go masturbate if a woman came into the office wearing a dress. When one arrived in a skirt, he suggested she do a handstand for the office. Grosser still, he apparently, quote, got into the habit of slipping behind women and asking, can you feel it, end quote. He also grabbed the behinds of men in the office too. The article continues. Another testimony, more chilling, is that of Louise. December, 2015, the theme of the evening is back to the future. For once, the young woman is in a dress. Tommy, her supervisor, allegedly tried to forcefully kiss her while members of her team held her. She struggles, screams, and manages to flee, she tells us. Traumatized, the next day she confides in a manager of the company and is explained that she has misinterpreted her actions and it was just a joke, something he often does. If he is untouchable, we are often told, it is because he is very, very close to Surge. Creative director of Ubisoft for 20 years, he oversees the entire editorial strategy of the company to the point that no project can be born nor move forward without its approval. A key man whose right arms become mechanically very powerful, we are told that of all the vice presidents, Tommy is the favorite. And this is a truly upsetting aspect to all of this. Not only did this happen, not only did Tommy get away with it, but he had executive support while doing it. People were perfectly aware that this was occurring. So for Ubisoft to act surprised or unaware in any shape or form is a disservice to those that had stepped forward. Now, I obviously can't speak to how much Eves or the other brothers knew of this branch of Ubisoft and what they were up to. Another man only referred to as MB in the article also took part in this as he was the former personal assistant of Surge. Louise claimed that MB antagonized her assistant at one point, even forbidding her to use an elevator because a little exercise will do her good. When the assistant told him to back off in the spring of 2015, MB even went so far as to threaten her with a small knife. A hierarchical supervisor apparently victim blamed this assistant and said that she should have known MB was toxic. MB was sent to the production department later on and eventually left the company in 2018. Nobody could trust HR, nobody could talk to anyone, and many people simply did not feel safe. Still, the reports didn't end. Later, this same newspaper came out with yet another article updating the situation on July 11th. They wrote that over 100 witnesses confirmed the toxicity at Ubisoft in France, and Serge was not only the enabler, but a disgusting abuser himself. Now, the language here is gonna be a little bit confusing as again, this is Google Translate doing the work, but they write. Serge, surrounded by his vice presidents, said that this badly fucked hindered his creativity and that it was necessary to enlarge his mind, 
hard cock strokes in the butt and spin her around until she understands. Tatiana begins a litany of intersecting horrors about reporting tools. In a work meeting, he sets people down in one man, one woman mode before whispering into the ear of these senior executives. Voila, there is sexual tension. There, we will have to do something before the end of the reunion. At a working dinner, he pushes creative directors to drink until they get sick. He asks the waitress to bring back all the bottles of alcohol from the restaurant, from the company funds, of course, and yells, you're a pedal if you don't drink. On numerous occasions during the investigation, our witnesses spoke of the dog grunts that Serge allegedly uttered in front of women. A dozen alerts confirm this. He allegedly blocked a woman in the elevator and stuck her in, growling and staring her in the eye. Other lieutenants of the editorial would have done the same thing to the point that it becomes a trademark, adds Tatiana. Though the first bit of this is a bit tricky to understand. What I can clearly get from this is that Serge was no better than Tommy. Cecile Cornet, head of HR, also came under fire because she was, well, useless to these employees. The newspaper explains that HR didn't hold anyone responsible, even when they knew how bad things had gotten. They were Ubisoft's organ of silence, Tatiana said. They even explicitly refused talking about harassment and discrimination in the workplace, not only actively covering these things up, but refusing to even attempt to make changes. These two, Tommy and Serge, did resign, but Cecile Cornet, it wasn't confirmed that she left the company. And if you ask me, I think she should have been fired. Other sources claim she did leave completely, but I'm more inclined to believe it was just a demotion as some sources cite this as being the case. Regardless, keep Tommy in the back of your mind because we're gonna return to him in just a moment. Now, aside from the executives, this behavior had permeated every damn branch of this rotted Ubisoft tree. Stone Chin, Ubisoft's PR director, was another higher up whose behavior was brought to light during this outpouring of testimonies. A 2012 accusation of sexual assault was revealed. Chin denied them saying they were two incidents when he asked coworkers out and they declined and he gave them the cold shoulder in response. Although that's not exactly a great look, it certainly pales in comparison to actual assault as Ubisoft didn't fire him for sexual assault, or at least didn't seem to bring it up when he was terminated, it could have been that they were more paranoid about that coming up and found someone or some other reason to fire him and replace him. Either way, Chin even admits his management style was passive aggressive, disrespectful, and he gave the cold shoulder to coworkers that wouldn't date him. So it's good that they were trying to clear house in a panic, but unfortunately they still had a lot more to do. While this was largely happening in France, the environment and attitudes in Toronto weren't exactly much better. In Toronto, the culture was reminiscent of the one in France. Booze-filled events could prove hostile to the women that worked at the Toronto location, and the idea of a frat boy culture, as we've seen before, came into play. Kotaku wrote, sources who shared their experiences at these events spoke of men at Ubisoft Toronto who pretended to be producers to try and get newer women at the studio to dance with them. One person recalled a man who asked for a blowjob as a punchline to a demeaning joke. And some men, two sources said, would get too close, invading personal space, touching shoulders or rubbing arms while trying to make unwanted advances. Often there was alcohol involved, as there appears to be many at Ubisoft Toronto events. Much of the studio's Facebook page looks like an ad shoot for a beer company, to be totally honest. Directors would get drunk and get handsy, one person said. Even if you rejected their advances, it would continue to happen. It would happen in public and be laughed off in public and alcohol would be used as an excuse, or it was just how that person is. Yet, according to this source, the choking allegations against Maxime Bayland stood out to many at the people of the Toronto location. It was said to have happened in 2014 during a party to celebrate the launch of Far Cry 4. This incident truly illustrated how deep in the ground the company was. Not only did Jane not report what happened because she didn't feel as though she could, but Max told her that he didn't even remember it happening. Apparently, once Jane decided not to go to HR, a coworker who knew of the incident tried to file on her behalf half. She was told nothing could be done without an official statement from Jane herself. I don't see Max as some mustache twirling villainous type, Jane said. It's not like that. Instead, she said the part that really bothered her was how she felt manipulated into not being able to do anything about it afterward. Not to excuse any bad behavior, of course, that should be reprimanded. But at the same time, there are a lot of people who could have done a lot of stuff and didn't. A former Ubisoft employee alleges that they saw a lot of women's careers destroyed by speaking up at the company. And since the company structure is almost all white guys, anyone that causes a fuss will get pushed out. 
Another former employee says they were literally told boys will be boys when trying to file a complaint. And of course, in an environment like this, it's hardly any wonder that deeper issues arose. One woman accused Adrian Gabinigi, a prominent Ubisoft development liaison based at the studio to work on marketing Watchdogs Legion of sexually assaulting her. Others claimed he harassed them as well. According to Gama Sutra, in addition to the harassment, even rape allegations were brought against him. Several firsthand accounts posted online detail how Gabinaji abused his power of position to manipulate, harass, and assault multiple women. One person recalls how Gabinaji pressured her into reciprocating his flirtatious advances and sexual comments when she was 18 years old. And after apologizing for that initial behavior over a year later, he then groped and raped her at an industry event. Regarding the rape accusation, they claim Gabinaji asked them to meet him and some friends in a hotel lobby ahead of the PAX industry party. Gabinaji, however, arrived alone and asked if they wanted to head to his friend's room where the rest of the group was apparently waiting. After brushing aside a feeling of panic and following them to the room, they saw there was no one else in the room. I'm still not ready to relive the intimate details publicly, but that's when he forced himself on me. It wasn't the longest experience, as he had said at the time his friends were expecting us, but it was enough for him to get out of me what he clearly wanted from the start and to put me in my place, they wrote. Though he has denied the assault claim in a Medium post, it was deleted shortly afterwards, and Ubisoft once again said they were looking very closely into the allegations. As far as I can tell, either nothing came of the investigations or Ubisoft simply didn't have enough information to fire him, as after all of this information came out and the dust started to settle, he was actually still working there. Now, one of the reasons I said to keep Tommy in the back of your mind is because according to Forbes, he did try to actually leave quietly, but it didn't go well for them. Ubisoft would allow this and instead opted to fire them. And their article about this reads, in response to this, Guillaumat said, each time we have been made aware of this conduct, we have made actually tough decisions and we made sure those decisions had a clear and positive impact. So that's very important. It has now become clear that certain individuals betrayed the trust I placed in them and did not live to Ubisoft's shared values. I have never compromised on my core values and ethics and never will. I will continue to run and transform Ubisoft to face today's and tomorrow's challenges. While resignations allow those to leave to collect a payout and find new employment with relative ease, being fired is a black mark on somebody's record that makes it more difficult for them to work elsewhere, which if the allegations are true, is a good thing. If Guillemot is now opting to terminate employment rather than push executives out the back door and hope for the best, this would suggest a much tougher stance on what's been going on in his company, which can only be a good thing. And again, as much as I applaud this move, the question remains, how much did the brothers know? Eves may have seemed to take it seriously, but so many sources point to the higher ups being perfectly aware of this behavior. This frat house behavior has happened time and time again, especially at these studios. So shouldn't that have been higher up to prevent this from happening in the first place? Was this a case of Eves being left in the dark or not doing enough to keep his company safe? Michel Ansel too left the company in 2020, though his reasons were purely stress related. Still, with so many higher ups and pillars of the company gone and their reputation in the toilet, things were not looking good for Ubisoft. And don't get me wrong, I want this to be a redemption story. See, I started getting into video games by playing Assassin's Creed. Growing up, my parents didn't allow me to play video games, so it really wasn't until I went away to college and literally moved to a different state that I was finally able to try playing video games for like the first time. And I had started some of the Assassin's Creed games, but I think it was like in 2013 when Assassin's Creed Black Flag came out that it just captured me entirely. And from that moment on, I was absolutely hooked into trying all sorts of different video games. So, and I'm obviously interjecting a little bit of like opinion of my personal experience here, obviously. To have to actually do a corporate casket on a company that really started my like experience and enjoyment into video games and to have them end up on my channel and to have to do this episode, it absolutely fucking sucks. And to know that, you know, there isn't really a clear redemption arc right now. And I don't really feel great about even playing the Black Flag game anymore. It just, it just leaves a terrible taste in my mouth. 
But anyway, I would love to be able to tell you that Eve's turned the company around and made it all one big happy family again. And sure, he's apologized, but as far as we know, little has actually changed. And earlier this year, one source actually explained. An investigation by French publication Le Telegram published in early May revealed that a first wave of legal proceedings was due to start this month in relation to the harassment cases. The collective action is led by a games workers union that had previously called for testimonies to build a case against Ubisoft. Since the wave of accusations targeting Ubisoft's toxic culture, which also pointed at serious dysfunction in its HR departments, the company has attempted to make changes, but the impact of these changes seem to have been minimal so far, and the publication has reported that. Now, we know that Cecile Cornet actually stepped down and left the company in, I believe, July, 2020. So at least that part of the HR staff is covered, but these harassment issues and the people that are in power, some of them are still there. The point here is Ubisoft and Eves may have seemed apologetic at first, like they were taking responsibility, but now the whole, we are making changes and we care just sounds really hollow and insulting because many of the problem people were just moved to different positions. Eves made multiple promises to do better, but he doesn't really seem intent on following through on those. In July, 2020, the French labor union Solidaris Informatique announced they were coordinating a collective lawsuit against Ubisoft as well. So I have to wonder if Eves is holding his tongue because of that. As far as that goes, some of the more recent sources I can find on the matter states that on July 15th, 2021, a complaint was filed at the Bobke Criminal Court of Maud Beckers, both representing the union and several victims of the company. Everyone deserves to feel safe at work, period. In addition to the lawsuit, an open letter to Eves was made, criticizing the way these issues were handled. Employees say the letter collected over a thousand signatures, begging Eves to truly take action and to make the changes he promised and to prove that he cared. He might tell people to speak their minds, yet the action of sidelining those who do speak out say otherwise. Personally, I feel like Eves wants to just move on already and pretend that this never happened. Ubisoft seemed on top of the world at one point, a family, a great company to work for, and now they struggle to find and retain talent. So it's really no wonder that Ubisoft employees stand by those at Activision. They've faced similar abuses and disturbing, upsetting work environments. And if anyone understands, it's definitely these two groups of employees. So with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to be ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new or that I may have clarified a couple things about the story of what happened at Ubisoft because honestly, when it all came out, it just felt like a big jumble of words and it took me a long time to really piece together and understand what happened. If you do enjoy these types of episodes, please make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all of the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure that you click my Linktree link in my description box. It will have links to all of my social media Media and projects that I'm involved in in a neat little organized list. So thank you so much for making it to this episode of The Corporate Casket. I appreciate your time today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.